Welcome to the Space Telescope Public Lecture Series. Uh, tonight's talk, The Universe of Dante Alighieri, from the descendant of, of Dante Alighieri, Spirello di Sorego Alighieri. I am your host, uh, Dr. Frank Summers, from the Office of Public Outreach at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And as always, I want to thank our wonderful tech team, Thomas Marufu and Grant Justice. I will also note that uh, management has decided that the P Space Telescope Public Lecture Series will continue to be online only through the rest of 22, 2022 and also during 2023. So for the foreseeable future, we will continue to be online only and we will not have the in-person uh, presentations in the STSCI Auditorium. Our upcoming talks uh, next month on November 1st, Stephanie Lamassa from Space Telescope will talk about black holes. How do we see that which gives off no light? On December 6th, we will do high energy astronomy with the Swift Observatory, and that will feature Steve Kirby from the Penn State University. On January 10th, we will have a talk, but I have not scheduled it. So as usual, I put in my placeholder a fascinating topic by an insightful speaker. Uh, when we do have that uh, talk booked, it will uh, appear on our website, www.stsci.edu slash public hyphen lectures. Uh, on that web page, you will find a link to our webcasts, uh, both our YouTube playlist and our STSCI webcast archives, as well as the um, email uh, list where you can put in your email address and hit the subscribe button. Also on our website, we have the list of the upcoming lectures. And if you click on one of those lectures, you will get the details, the uh, uh, the description and the speaker, as well as after it's been recorded, links to the STSCI webcast and the YouTube webcast. Uh, for announcements, um, as I said, sign up at the website. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Hubble Space Telescope, that's all one word, Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, you will get new video notices and reminders of live events such as this. Finally, if you have comments or questions, you can send them to the email address public lecture, all one word, at stsci.edu. Furthermore, you can follow us on social media. We have social media channels for the Hubble Space Telescope, for the Webb Space Telescope, and for the Space Telescope Science Institute. And you can find those on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. I myself do a very minor amount of stuff on social media on Facebook and Twitter as Dr. Frank Summers. And now our news from the universe for October 2022. Our story tonight, a tarantula caught by Webb. This is the Large Magellanic Cloud, and it is a dwarf galaxy that is a satellite galaxy of our own Milky Way galaxy. And you may say, oh, all right, it's a dwarf galaxy. It's kind of small and everything. But it has the largest star-forming region anywhere in the local group. This star-forming region, called the Tarantula Nebula, is larger than any star-forming region in the Milky Way galaxy or in the Andromeda galaxy. There is an incredible amount of star formation going on here. And of course, astronomers have studied it many, 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 many times. We have studied it with the Hubble Space Telescope. And here is an image from, I think this is 2012 from Hubble. Uh, this is both a little bit of visible light and a good amount of the near infrared from Hubble. And you can see these bubbles uh, created here in the, the structure by newborn stars and the winds and the supernova explosions that can happen in here. There's a huge cluster of stars in here. Whoops, I didn't mean to hit that. A uh, huge cluster of stars in here called R136. That's sort of the core of the Tarantula Nebula. Uh, it has also been studied um, with the Spitzer Space Telescope. Now, remember, this Hubble is done in visible and a, and a good amount of near infrared. So if I go to the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is infrared, it doesn't look that different. 
um, uh, because we have a good amount of infrared in the Hubble image. But you can see uh, this green material here. If I blink back to the Hubble, that corresponds pretty well to the material seen in Spitzer. Of course, Hubble has a much finer resolution than Spitzer does and sees more detail. But if you want even more detail, well, the James Webb Space Telescope has looked at the Tarantula Nebula now. Um, and it took an image in this region here of the Tarantula Nebula, a region that's centered on that star cluster called R136 that I mentioned before. Um, and you can see just from this that this uh, that Webb is such, such, such higher. It's a quantum leap in resolution of, over Spitzer. Um, and let's bring that image full screen. And you can see all of the rich detail we have here uh, in the Tarantula Nebula from Webb. But this doesn't actually do it justice because this image is about one fifth or one sixth the size scale that you're seeing it uh, on here. So let me zoom into the region around that star cluster and give you a somewhat full resolution view of it. Now, this is, of course, going to be mollified by my computer to uh, out to the, the, the webcast onto your computer. And so you're not probably not going to see all the incredible detail here, but just look at all the stars we're seeing here in R136, all right? And if we go to a region that's got a uh, nebula structure, well, that's really, really cool too. And you get incredible detail. So we're trying to illustrate for you the detail that Webb is able to see with a six and a half meter mirror looking in the infrared. All right, so that's sort of be expected. We knew Webb was going to be a quantum leap over Spitzer. But how does it compare to Hubble? Well, this is one of the few images where Hubble has a lot of infrared. Um, so it's actually a relatively apples to apples comparison of Hubble versus Webb. All right. And so the, on the left is a Hubble image that I believe is from 2016. And on the right is the brand new Webb image of the Tarantula Nebula. Um, and you can see in, in detail, just from this large scale view, that uh, Webb has a has a, has a just a bit more resolution. Okay, it's about a factor of one and a half, factor of two resolution. That's better better than Hubble. But we're going to zoom in on this lower left region here um, and show you a little more detail. Right? Okay. So here's the Hubble image, and I'm going to be able to blink back and forth. And here is the Webb image. Okay, and Hubble and web and there you can see that that there's just that much more sharpness in the web image than there is in the hubble image uh, and also in the hubble image we see a lot of this dark gas down here okay this dark gas that um, is opaque to wavelengths that hubble observes but when you go further into the infrared you actually see through it and you see more detail and structure of what's happening inside the, these gas clouds all right and this kind of comparison is something that you know I haven't done much. I don't I haven't done much before. I've done it, I've done it with a bunch of things, but it's hard to get you know images that are reasonably well to comp compare. Um, but it brings up questions in people, and people ask me, "All right, well, which is better, Hubble or Webb?" All right, and I usually respond to that by saying, "All right, well, which is better, an SUV or a sports car?" All right now. If you're going out to a construction site or you want to go off-roading or you want to you know haul stuff, you want that SUV. And if you're going out onto the highway, you want to zoop around, you want to take those tight curves, well, you want that sports car. All right. The same thing is going on here. If you're looking in visible light, you want Hubble. If you're looking in infrared light, you want James Webb. All right. So it's not like one is better than the other. They're designed to do different things. Hubble is designed to look at optical light, visible light, um, and Webb is designed to look at infrared light. And there's a bit of an overlap, okay? And where there is an overlap, uh, Webb, being the newer telescope, actually has, has better resolution. And actually, one of the main advantages of Webb is that it can get to a certain uh, depth of, of, of an image faster it has newer detectors it can get to it can get to the uh the faint stuff faster than hubble could do on the same thing but really you know uh instead of choosing between a sports car and an suv why not both huh and that's what we've got here we have a 
wonderful optical telescope. We have a wonderful infrared telescope. And we're sort of in like a golden age where we get to use them both together to learn more. We take images with Hubble, we take images with Webb, we compare them, we get new, new views, we have more understanding and more science. So these next few years when we have both telescopes operational are gonna be wonderful and I really look forward to the results we're gonna get. All right, that's our news summary for today. Um, let me stop my screen share um, and invite uh, Spirello to turn on his screen share. Unfortunately, Spirello, one of the reasons we started this late is that Spirello's uh, camera is not working. Uh, his screen share is working, but not his camera. So Spirello, whenever you have it, uh, right ah, there, he started his screen share. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, our speaker tonight, a descendant of Dante Alighieri, is Spirello de Sorego Alighieri. Um, and the most important thing about him to know is that he's not just some random descendant. He's actually an astrophysicist. Now, he's retired, um, but he did work at the Astrophysical Observatory in Arcetri um, uh, before he came in and did this research on his ancestor. So, ladies and gentlemen, Spirello de Sorego Alighieri. Hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, for this uh, conference, um, we are going to make a big step back in time, actually 700 years. America was not yet discovered then. Uh, anyway, um, uh, yes, I am a descendant of Dante, uh, but you know, this is not the important thing because I have no merit in it and of course no guilt either. Um, it's, it's not an easy thing to live with, but I was helped by my father. Um, when I was very young, starting to reading, six years old, he gave me um, a book sign uh, which had some verses of Dante, which are the few ones that I know by heart. And, and they say, um, actually, uh, let me make uh, a note. I'm going to cite lots of verses of Dante. I'm going to show them to you in Italian because this is the way Dante wrote them but I'm going to translate them to you. So these verses, you can see it in Italian, and they say, oh little, our blood nobility, you are like a mantle that soon will get shorter, so that if you don't add to it day by day, time will go around with scissors. So this means that nobility and descendants have little meaning you, if you don't add to it day by day. Um, okay, so this is what we are trying to do, trying to do tonight. Um, and um, in fact, I've studied Dante in high school, but very little after that, until, uh, some years ago, after most of my astrophysical career had gone, that I am sharing with Dante something very important, apart from my last name, which is the, the passion for astronomy. Dante had this passion, there is no doubt about it. In, in the Convivio, which is the, um, if you want, the um, treaty, uh, philosophical, historical, technical, scientific treaty that Dante wrote, in the beginning of the Convivio, he, he says that science is, is our ultimate, the ultimate perfection of our soul, in which stays our ultimate happiness. So this is clearly a, the declaration of love 
for science. And a little later, still in the convivio, Dante says, well, this astronomy, more than any of the other sciences, is noble and high because its subject is noble and high and deals about the movement of the sky, etc. So science is perfection of our soul and ultimate happiness. And among sciences, the, the, the highest and most noble is astronomy. There is obviously clear passion for astronomy in Dante, and he shows it throughout his works, and mostly, in, of course, in, in, in the Divine Comedy. In fact, the Divine Comedy is the story in poetic form of a journey throughout the whole universe, like a science fiction book. Anyway, um, of course, Dante was talking was talking about um, astronomy as it was known at its time. At its time, it was still uh, leading astronomy, the Ptolemaic system done by the Greeks and uh, got to, to Dante, to Europe, back again through the Arabs because because after the, the burn of the library in Alessandria, uh, uh, most of the knowledge in the Western world was lost. But fortunately, the Arabs kept it and, and then they transferred it back to Europe uh, later. Okay, anyway, the Ptolemaic system, you know, it, it says that the earth is in the middle of the word of the universe. Earth is standing still in the middle of the universe. And then there are objects turning around it. First, the moon, Mercury, the sun, the sun is all, also turning around the earth. Then Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then the, the fixed stars. So that's the, the system at Dante's time. And of course, he's talking about this um well <laughs> there are several ways in which dante uses astronomy in his works and one of them maybe well one of the most important ones is is that he uses astronomy to tell about time um timing of events is often uh shown uh, uh, with an astronomical uh, reference. For example, here in, in the Inferno, he says that yesterday was full moon. Yesterday was the night in which Dante had entered Inferno, had started his trip, and, and so the, the, it was full moon. Uh, well, this is not enough to tell about the, the timing of Dante's journey. Actually, there is something important to tell about this. Uh, of course, Dante's journey is an imaginary one, but Dante was not a person who did things by chance. No, no, no. Even his imaginary journey had to have a place in time, very precise place in time. All readers of Dante throughout the centuries agree about this, that the, the journey had to have a precise timing. Um, the problem is that the readers of Dante do not agree about what this timing should be. Um, of course, and so let's look at this. Um, he, he, he says, that it was full moon. But you know, full moon there is one every month, and, 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 and of course, 12 or 13 every year, so it doesn't tell you much. Um, most of the readers of Dante, particularly in, in the old times, thought that the uh, journey of Dante had happened in the spring of 1300. 
Well, spring is easy because Dante says that the, the sun was in Aries, so it, it was spring. But 1300, why 1300? Because 1300 was the first jubileum year that, that Pope Bonifacio VIII had uh, declared. Um, and there are also other historical um, mentions in the Divine Comedy that refer to 1300. The problem is that the astronomical references in Divine Comedy do not agree with this. In particular, this, this event. You know, we are at the start of the Purgatory. Dante had just come out of hell, of the earth, of inside the earth, to back to see the stars, as he says. And of course, the, the first thing he does, he looks up and he sees, what does he see? Uh, of course, he sees Venus, because Venus is the brightest object in the night sky, apart from the moon. Uh, and of course, if, if it's there, you, you, you would immediately see it. And what does he say? You, you can read it in Italian. It says that the, the planet Venus uh, was in, in the east, and it was in the constellation of, of Pisces. Well, this is very clear, very clear. You know, Venus can be seen either in the evening, just after sunset, uh, or in the morning before sunrise. This is because the, the orbit of Venus is inside the orbit of the Earth, and so you can only see Venus quite close to the Sun. Now, the problem, and you know, the, the, whether you see Venus in the evening or in the morning depends on the relative position of, of Venus, the Earth, and the Sun, which changes, but changes, it takes many months to change. And the problem is that in the, in the spring of 1300, Venus was seen in, in the evening, not in the morning. And it was not in the piece, it was in, in Taurus. So it doesn't correspond to Dan, what Dante says. The spring of 1300 is not a good date for Dante's journey, according to this astronomical uh, reference. On the other hand, the, a year later, 1301, uh, in the spring, Venus was seen in the morning, and it was in the constellation of species, just like Dante says. So for us astronomers, the journey of Dante started in the night between the 24th and the 25th of March, 1301. It was full moon. Venus was seen in the morning, and it was in the pieces. Now you can ask, what about the Jubileum? Well, the Jubileum was promoted by Pope Bonifacio VIII. And this Pope was not someone that Dante liked. But anyway, uh, Dante was from Florence, and at the time, the calendar in Florence was such that the first day of the year was the 25th of March. So the night between the 24th and the 25th of March was still in the Jubileum year, if you really want to listen to that. Anyway, I don't want to uh, hide the fact that in the Divine Comedy, there is a conflict between uh, historical dating and an astronomical dating. Nobody has solved this problem. And of course, it's, we cannot solve it now. Uh, I just want to 
pointed out. And of course, for us astronomers, the, the, the line dating is the astronomical one. Um, yeah, let's go on with other astronomical reference. We are still on the first um, uh, canto of the Purgatory. So just after uh, Dante looked up and saw Venus, he says, I looked on my right and looked for the other pole. And I saw four stars, which were, we had not, had never seen before, except to the first people, except from the first people. Well, there are several interesting things here. Uh, you know, Dante was someone who had traveled by night several times. And at those times, of course, he didn't have any lights. There were no lights. So the only things he could use to orient himself, knowing where, where he was going, was look at the stars. And, you know, in, in the Northern Hemisphere, if you want to orient yourself, the first thing you do, you look at the, uh, at the Northern stars, the, uh, the polar star, because we have in our hemisphere, in the Northern Hemisphere, we have the chance that the, the axis, the rotation axis of the Earth, if you prolong it to the, to the sky, it, it, it gets to the sky very close to a bright star, which is the polar star. And that, of course, points to the North. So now Dante has got out of, of, the, of the Earth on the other side. He knew that. So he knew that he could not look at the, at the polar star, the northern polar stars, but still he knew that the, the rotation axis of the earth would, would get to the, to the sky, also to the south. So he, in order to, to understand how he was out of the sky, how he was oriented, he, he, he looks at the other pole. That's what he does. And, you know, the, 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 the problem is that on the other, uh, on the southern sky, where the rotation axis of the Earth gets to the, gets to the sky, there is no bright star. They are not lucky as we are. But near there, there is a southern cross. The sound of course is the four stars. So he saw he sees the four stars. Now, the, one, one could ask, what, how did he know about the Southern Cross? Well, that's easy. That's easy because Dante had uh, access to uh, star maps done by the Arabs. And the Arabs, because they knew about the Southern Cross, because you can see you can see the Southern Cross from South Arabia, and of, of also the Arabs were traveling around, so they knew about the, the Southern Cross, and they had put it in the in the in the star maps that Dante could could have access to. So there is no problem that he knew about the the the, um, the Southern Cross. But the problem is is the following verse, which says that these four stars had never been seen. Uh, before, except to the first people. Who are these first people who, who saw the, the Southern Cross? Now, again, here there is an easy answer and, and a more clever one. The easy answer is, well, uh, the first people are Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve lived in the, in the terrestrial paradise, the terrestrial paradise is, is on the top of the mountain of Purgatory, and of course it is on the other side. So they, they, uh, they would have seen the, the Southern, Southern Cross. But, but that's uh, not a nice explanation, and it gets, it, it's not right, also because Dante would have never uh, called people Two persons, Adam and Eve, are not people. They are two. 
So if he says about people, it cannot be Adam and Eve. And there is a, a much more uh, interesting explanation to this, which has to do with the processional, procession of equinoxes. Uh, now, I suppose I don't need to explain to you what the procession of, of equinoxes is. Well, it's, it's, it's a simple fact that the uh, rotation axis of the Earth turns around in, in a cycle which is about 26,000 uh, years long, which makes that the, um, the rotation axis of the Earth points to different stars uh, throughout the centuries. And of course, also that the, the stars that you can see at any latitude would change in, in, in the centuries. And in fact, if you use uh, Stellarium to, um, to see what was visible from Florence 7,000 years ago, well, you can clearly see that the Southern Cross was visible from Florence because of the procession of the equinoxes. Why, why did I put did I try 7,000 years ago? Well, because at the time of Dante, it was thought that the, the creation of the world and, and soon after that, the uh, population of the earth by the descendants of Adam and Eve happened 5,000 years before Christ, which is 7,000 years ago. So 7,000 years ago, the Southern Cross was visible at our latitudes. And the first people that Dante talks about are actually the, the descendants of Adam and Eve who populated the um, our lands, the Europe and our latitudes, which is a much more satisfactory explanation. Okay. Um, okay, well, the question is, did Dante know about the procession of the equinoxes? Of course he did. In fact, in the Convivio, again, he says that uh, there is this movement, very slow movement, which goes from west to east by a degree every hundred years. A degree every hundred years means that to do a full turn, 360 degrees, it would take 36,000 years. Now, 36,000 years is is a bit longer than the 26,000 years that we know is the period of the procession of the equinoxes, but that doesn't matter. Uh, okay, the procession of the equinoxes, the period was overestimated by some amount, but that's not the problem. He knew about it and he could he could tell that, that uh, the Southern Cross could be visible by Florence long ago. Okay. Um, now we go to um, another uh, part of the Divine Comedy. It's the uh, 20, 26th Canto of the Inferno. And there is Ulysses who, well, actually Dante and Virgilio encounter Ulysses. And Ulysses tell, tell Dante about his last trip. Ulysses did a last trip uh, when he was already uh, old with his uh, um, uh, friends who were also old. And they, what they did, they went to Gibraltar. Gibraltar was, the, was taught at the time of Dante to be the extreme um, west of the, of the world. And it was something that you could not go farther because uh, there was, the rest was completely unknown. But in fact, Ulysses, he wanted to discover what was after that. So what he did, uh, you see, um, he crossed Gibraltar. And of course, when, when, when doing that, he would leave Sevilla, so Spain, to his right and to his left, he would leave Ceuta, which is in, in, in Morocco. Uh, and and uh, okay, well, this shows actually what is the geography at Dante's time. You see, these are the emerged lands that were 
to, to exist at Dante's time, they are all in the Northern Hemisphere, and not by chance, Jerusalem is at the center of them. If you go 90 degrees to the west of Jerusalem, you get to, to Gibraltar. If you go 90 degrees to the east, you get to the, um, the exit of Gange, the Gange River, which was thought to be the extreme east. And then to the north, uh, to the northern Europe, and, and to the south, to equatorial Africa. So that were the emerged lands. Uh, so Ulysses uh, crosses Gibraltar. And of course, what they did was, of course, they had uh, the, the back of their sheep in, in the east. And so they were going west, but they would, they would go left from the west, so south, south. And then, of course, going south, at some point, they crossed the equator. And if I, they say that, that they would see all the stars from, from, from the southern hemisphere, and, and our pole was so low that it went below the horizon. You know, when you cross the equator, the northern star doesn't get out of the sea. Um, so they were going south. This is another way to, to see it. So they crossed Gibraltar. They were going south, crossing the equator, and they were going on. And at some point, they reached this mountain of Purgatory, which is uh, uh, the opposite of Jerusalem, you see. And of course, seeing this land after five months of traveling, in, in sea, of course, they, they were happy, but soon uh, they were not happy anymore because from the new earth, it, they, it started a storm which got to his boat and, and uh, make, make, make the boat turn three times. And at the fourth times, the boat went down and, and, they, they, and it sank and they all died. Um, well, so what I want to point to you is, is just uh, actually one important thing, which uh, actually the most important thing which I'm going to tell you, which I forgot to tell you at the beginning. Uh, Dante, as a medieval man and as a genius, how he was, he could get contain in, into his mind all the knowledge available at its time and all well. This is something that for us, it is hard to understand because we've lost this capability. We've lost this capability, not only because we are not genius as Dante was, but also because the knowledge in all fields has, um, of course, grown very much in all these centuries, so that one single mind cannot contain all of them. But Dante could do it. Um, for us, it's not easy to understand, but there are several effects of, from, from this fact. One important one is that in order to understand Dante, uh, one person is not enough. Because we, uh, at our time, we people who deal with knowledge, if we want to say something new in the field of knowledge, we have to specialize. There's no way out of this. So we are all specialized. We know well one thing, uh, but the other things we don't know well, we cannot know well. So in order to explain Dante, you, you cannot listen to just one person. You have to listen to several persons. Don't trust somebody who tells you, I know everything about Dante. That's not possible. Um, so the other effect is that 
I'm going to talk to you about astronomy in Dante. Um, and I don't want to uh, say that, that this is all. Actually, I invite you to listen to other people for the other aspects of, uh, of Dante. Um, anyway, so uh, now I've talked to you about the, the Ulysses uh, story in Dante, just to show you about the geography. But of course, in, 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 in Ulysses stories in Dante, there is much more, but you have to listen to other people to know that. Okay, let's go on. Um, yeah, the past is at the center of the earth. Um, you know, Dante and Virgilio get down into hell until they reach the center of the earth. At the center of the earth, there is Lucifer, um, the devil, who, who is stuck there, just at the center. And so they go down Lucifer's body until uh, they reach the, the center of the earth. And at the time of Dante, it was thought that gravity was a property uh, of the center of the earth. Every uh, body is attracted by the center of the earth. So what happens at the center of the earth is that gravity turns over. So where, when they go along the body of Lucifer, at some point, gravity turns over. And, and so what, what, what they do is, is they, they, were, they were going down, and at some point, they are starting to go up. So that Dante, in the beginning, he thinks, well, are we going back into hell? No, they are not. They are going to the other side. Of course, we all know that this is not true, and I don't need to explain this to you. Um, okay, well, this we have already said. Well, that's that's another another uh, aspect I want to tell you about astronomy in Dante. You know, the Milky Way. Dante talks several times about the Milky Way in the hell. And in the hell, he refers to the, the, the Greek mythological story about the origin of the Milky Way. And, and the Greek mythological story is that Fetonte, who was the son of Apollo, the, the god of, of the sun, and uh, Fetonte had taken the chariot of his father, the chariot was taking the sun around, and since uh, he took he took this chariot, uh, you know, as a, a, a as a son uh, stealing the cow of his father, and since he was did not know how to drive, how to drive it, he went around uh, the sky in in a funny way, and 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 that trip left this um, uh, bright strip across the sky, which is the Milky Way. So that's the, that's the mythological story. And Dante refers to it in the hell, actually not just one time, a couple of times. But then uh, in, the, in the paradise, he's, he's, he talks again about the Milky Way. And, and he says, you see here, that the Milky Way is is made of minor and major lights, which is stars. So this is our, our view. And actually in the Convivio, he's much more precise about this. Um, and he says that the galaxy is nothing, nothing else than a, a multitude of, of fixed stars that in that part are so small that we cannot distinguish them, but, but we see them as that uh, bright strip that we call galaxy. So this is very clear. So Dante knew that the galaxy was made of stars, but he was, as a medieval man, he was in the middle between 
the old mythological stories and the new, uh, if you want, explanations. Um, oops. Well, uh, this is an image of, uh, of the Milky Way um, as we know it. Uh, I don't need to tell you about the Milky Way. Uh, uh, this is an external galaxy which uh, looks very similar to what the Milky Way would look like if we could be able to see it from outside. Okay, um, this is the one but last uh, theme that I will tell you about tonight. Um, it, it, we are dealing about errors, we're dealing about mistakes. Now, of course, you know very well that mistakes are not a problem for us scientists. Actually, we know that in many cases, science progresses because we recognize that we've made some mistakes and we try to correct them. And, and, and by doing this, the uh, science goes on. Of course, this way to deal with mistakes is not is not the same for everybody, as we unfortunately know. But that's something else. Okay. Um, we are in the second canto of the paradise. Uh, Dante had to leave his leader Virgilio, who led him through hell and through to Inferno and, and, and Purgatory, uh, because Virgilio could not go beyond Purgatory because he was not baptized. Um, and so Dante had to find a new leader and he finds Beatrice, of course this is not by chance. Um, and, you know, starting his trip with Beatrice, um, the first uh, body, the first sky they get to is the sky of the moon. Uh, and, well, you know, the moon had a big problem. You know, the moon is the only uh, night sky body that you can distinguish, I mean, that you can resolve by naked eye. Uh, and of course, Dante only had naked eye, there were no instruments except from the eye. Um, all the other bodies in the sky, you know, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, they all, were all points. The only thing that, that Dante's eye could resolve in the night sky is the moon. But the moon had a problem. The moon had spots. Well, how comes that? They, they all told us that the sky is perfect. You know, circles, spheres. But the moon has, has spots. But this is not perfect. So how comes that? And, and of course, Dante, well, takes the opportunity that he has Beatrice. And so he asks him about the origin of, of, of moon spots. And, and you can see here, he says, he asked Beatrice, please tell me, what are the, these dark spots on this body that people down on the earth uh, think they are like the, um, the, the face of Caino? Well, the fact that they, at the time they thought that the the moon the, the the moon spot represent the face of Caino. Well, you can see on the moon spots whatever you like, but so that was the question, and so it goes on here and, and it says, "Ella so Beatrice smiles a bit." Now be careful when Beatrice smiles. There is something important happening. And, and then Beatrice goes on. Uh, well, Beatrice tries to answer. And, and the first thing she says is, well, be careful. 
the first thing that comes to your mind is not necessarily the um, the right one. And then Beatrice does something that we are all very much used to it because uh, we all uh, we've all been pupil. And some of us have been teacher. You know, when a when a student asks his teacher a question, uh, well, often the teacher reverses the the question to the to to the student, and so this is what what Beatrice does. Ma dimmi quel che tu da te ne pensi. Please tell me what you think about it. So Beatrice reverses the question to Dante, and Dante he has to say something, and Dante says, well. He says, well, I think that what the, 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 the spots are the fact that there are different densities inside the moon. Corpi rari e densi. Uh, well, this idea is, is an old idea. So Dante refers to an idea of Averroes, which was accepted by Albert the Great. And he also talks about it in the convivio. You see, this rarità means means little density, which which is causing the the the, the spots in the moon. Well, <laughs> and then here starts the answer of Beatrice. And Beatrice starts by saying, "Well, you're wrong." You're wrong. Listen to me. Listen to what I'm telling you. So this is about errors. Uh, the first thing Beatrice does to confute, uh, to refute Dante's idea is this. She, she refers to the, the eighth sphere. The eighth sphere is the sphere of the fixed stars. In fact, she said that the eighth sphere shows you many lights, many stars. And in fact, she says, well, you know, the different stars in, in the eighth sphere in, in, um, have different brightness. Now, if the different brightness of the stars were due to a different density, as you say, for the moon spots, then the stars would have only one quality, one virtue, which is density. And this cannot be because every star has his own virtue, which is transferred from God to, to humans. Well, of course, this is an argument which is uh, theological, philosophical, but this is the first argument that Beatrice uses. But then she goes on and I invite you to, to read this whole canto uh, uh, because it's very interesting. And Beatrice then says the following thing. Well, if there are dense regions and less dense regions in the moon, and these are causing the moon spots, then there can only be two cases. Either the dense regions do not cover the whole face of the moon, or they cover it. Well, that's quite obvious. And then she said, well, the first case that the dense regions do not cover the whole face of the moon is not possible because during an eclipse, um, a solar eclipse, you know, in which in which the, the moon gets in front of the sun, uh, you would you would see the light of the sun going through this less dense regions of the moon that do not cover the whole face. So it is not possible that the less dense we the, the the dense region do not cover the whole face of the moon. The dense region must cover the whole face of the moon. That's clear. But then Beatrice says, well, you, you could think that still the moon spots are caused by the fact that the 
the dense regions are different depths inside the moon and that could cause the um, the moon spots in order to refute even this other hypothesis so completely uh, get rid of Dante's idea uh, Beatrice does a thought experiment a Gedanken experiment you know Einstein did the same centuries later in order to uh, explain his theories uh, so the thought experiment that uh, that Beatrice is talking about is the following tre specchi prenderai take three mirrors you place two of those mirrors in front of you at some distance and the third one you place it farther between the first two so at, at a larger distance between the first two and then you put a, a light on your back like a fire uh, a light something so that you can see reflected in all three mirrors uh, and then in the end you see in the end here she says well although the image which you see reflected in 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 the father mirror is smaller in size than those that you see affected into the other two still you will see it shine in the same way come convien chi ugualmente risplenda so this is for us astronomers is 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 a very clear thing it's the is the fact that the um, surface brightness of a of an object in the sky does not depend on its distance it's very clear the surface brightness is the ratio between the luminosity or the total luminosity of the object and the, uh, the solid angles obtained by the object and since it's the ratio between these two things and since both things uh, vary as uh, inversely as a square root of the distance their ratio is constant with the distance we all know this very well uh, but well there's something really wonderful happening here something really wonderful first Dante chooses as his scientific master a woman Beatrice it will take many centuries before a woman would be accepted in science you know maybe Marie Curie well you tell me well Dante had already done it second thing Beatrice but it's it's Dante who writes of course uses a Gedanken experiment in order to confute an idea Hmm? Einstein did the same many centuries later and third Beatrice but it still is Dante who writes talks about the constants of surface brightness with distance well I think we can give Dante a PhD in physics well if not a Nobel Prize um anyway uh well this is an image of the thought experiments uh you see the observer the three mirrors and the lamp in the back well the light in the back okay uh let's get on to my last argument for tonight it's about the whole structure of the universe of Dante's universe well we know the structure of Dante's universe starts from the Ptolemaic system we already said that the earth is at the center of the universe and then there are nine spheres above the earth the moon Mercury Venus the sun Mars Jupiter Saturn the fixed stars and the 
primo mobile, the prime mover, um, which is, you know, all these um, spheres around the Earth are turning faster and faster. And the primo mobile is the fastest turning one. And in fact, it was called prime mover because it was thought that it would give the movement to all the others. Then at the uh, end of the 27th canto of the paradise, Dante and Beatrice get to this primo mobile, to this prime mover, and they look on the other side and they see something symmetric. Another nine spheres, the, the angelic circles, actually spheres, and at the center of one inside the other, and at the center of them, there is a very bright spot of light, which is God. Well, <coughs> this structure, it made scientists uh, think that this structure is very similar to Einstein's hypersphere. You know, the Einstein hypersphere is the is the way uh, that the universe is structured in Einstein's idea. Um, the first person to think about this was a Swiss guy, a uh, mathematician, a physicist mathematician, Andreas Speiser. In 1925, he wrote about this, about the similarity of the structure of Dante's universe with the with with the Einstein hypersphere. You know, not many years after uh, Einstein's general relativity. But there is a very beautiful article, which I recommend you to read, by Mark Peterson, an American uh, mathematician and physicist. The, this article is in the American Journal of Physics, in, and it was, written, it was published in 1979. And this figure actually comes from that article. You see, this is the Ptolemaic universe with the Earth at the center and the nine spheres around it. And here is a symmetric thing, which is, which is beyond the prime mover. You see, it's very symmetric. Actually, this point P is the point where Dante and Beatrice get to the primo mobile. And at the end of the 27th canto of the paradise, Dante says about this point, he says, I cannot tell you which place Beatrice chose for us for this point. So it doesn't matter where they got to the primo mobile. What they would see on the other side would always be the same. Um, now, you see the question on the top. How could Dante think of an hypersphere? This is a question that we would like to understand. I think it's the important question. How could he think something that is similar to an hypersphere? And I think that the, the answer to this deals with the fact that uh, spherical geometry at the times of Dante was very well known, was even maybe better known that, than Euclidean geometry. Uh, you know, Euclidean geometry deals about uh, um, parallels, uh, deals with uh, square angles, deals with uh, Pythagoras theorem, and so on. Spherical geometry is completely different, is completely different. Spherical geometry, is, for example, is the geometry uh, on the surface of a sphere. Now, on the surface of a sphere, uh, you don't have parallels. There are no parallels. Uh, um, full circles 
uh, always have two points in common. So th there are no parallels. The Pythagorean theorem does not hold on, on the surface of the sphere. So it's a completely different geometry. And it was well known <laughs> at the time of Dante because they knew that sphere is where we live, is where we travel, is where we build. So it was important because of this. More so also, Dante had, a, had as a master Brunetto Latini. Brunetto Latini was a, was a teacher of Dante, and he had written a book, uh, the, the Treasure. This book had been written both in Italian and in, in Old French, and it's a sort of an encyclopedic book. It deals with many different things, and it also deals with spherical geometry. Now, how does he deal with it? He deals with it not by looking at a sphere from outside, but by being on a sphere, which is what we do every day. And he says, well, take two riders on a horse, starting from the same point of a spherical or, or a surface of a sphere, say the Earth, and they, they start from the same point into different directions. So what happens is that they travel, they travel, they travel, forget about mountains and seas, doesn't matter. They travel, 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 and then they meet again on the opposite side of the earth. If they travel further, they would meet again at the starting point. So this is something very simple that Dante could very well understand. Brunetto Latini had explained this to Dante. It's very easy to understand. Now, let's take this other example. Let's take two riders, two men, two aunts, whatever you like, leaving from the South Pole of the Earth, from the South Pole. Well, wh whichever direction he, he leaves, he would go north. He can only go north. And what happens when he goes north? He would cross circles of increasing size, you know, parallels of increasing size until he reaches the largest one, which is the equator. Now, if you put a parallel every 10 degrees from the South Pole to the equator, you would have, you would cross nine parallels, just like the nine skies that, that Dante crossed to reach the Prima Mobile. Going farther, from the equator, the traveler would cross circles of decreasing size until he gets to one point, the North Pole. Hmm? So what I'm telling you is very easy, very simple. Dante could very well understand this, no problem. So. What Dante has done to think about the structure of his universe, he has used the same example, the same thing, by increasing it by one dimension. So he starts from, from the Earth, crosses not nine circles, nine spheres, because there is one additional dimension, until the largest one the Primo Mobile. And after that, there are other nine spheres, smaller, one inside the other, until a point, luminous point, which is God. So you see, the way I'm telling you this is quite clear that Dante could do it, and he has done it. This is what Dante has done it, has done. Of course, he could not know, and he did not know, that this would be would become Einstein's hypersphere. No, he didn't know that. He, he doesn't tell it. Of course, it, only many centuries later we could we could guess about the similarities. But that, that's not important. But Dante could do it, and he has done it. 
Okay. Um, well, some details. Uh, the article by Mark Peterson about the similarity of Einstein uh, Dante universe structure and Einstein atmosphere. Well, starts by saying poetry and physics are similar in the universe. Of course, then there is the there is the equation of a, of the hypersphere, well known. The hypersphere is a is a is a three dimensional sphere in a four dimensional space, and the equation is like this. It's like the equation of a sphere with an additional with an additional item. There is a, there is a fourth dimension. In Dante's case, the fourth dimension is rotation velocity. Because in Einstein's, this is time uh, multiplied by the velocity of light is, a, is, a, is also a dimension. So this is what, but of course Dante could not know about this. He, did, he does not talk about time, but he has a fourth dimension, which is rotation velocity. In fact, the earth is standing still all the nine sky, Ptolemian skies above it, they turn around it faster and faster. And the, the, uh, the angelic circles, the angelic spheres, they keep turning faster and faster. So the, the rotation velocity is a coordinate which increases from the earth to, to God uniformly. So that's Dante's four dimension. Uh, well, let's skip this. If you want, you, you can read it in in in, in Mark Peterson paper. Yeah, I want to end this by telling you a few things. Well, the structure of Dante's universe solves quite a few problems that were quite severe at the time. Well, one of these problems was the fact that the Ptolemaic universe at the earth at the center of the universe. And you know, at the end, at the center of the earth, you have Lucifer. So having a universe which has at the center Lucifer is not something that they liked. Uh, in Dante's structure, at least, well, the universe has two centers. On one side, there is the earth with Lucifer, but at the other side, there is a black spot, which is God. So that was a problem, a, a, an important problem solved by Dante's universe structure. Um, the other thing, you know, they, you would, people at the time were asking questions, well, like, well, is God inside or outside the universe? And if God is inside the universe, what is outside the universe? You know, these are quite important questions. Well, Dante has solved it because clearly God is inside the universe. Dante sees it, he, he gets there. So the God is inside the universe. And what is outside? Well, there is nothing nothing outside the universe well um, i can explain this to you in, in, well i try to do it in two ways well first let's get one dimension back think that we are two-dimensional beings living in a two-dimensional world and our two-dimensional world is the surface of a sphere now, uh, our word is clearly unlimited because we can travel through it without finding any limit. We can go on traveling and there is no limit. But it's finite because the surface of a sphere has a certain finite surface. So unlimited and finite. And what's outside it? There's nothing because we are two dimensional. This is our two dimensional world, and outside there is nothing. Mm, you know, our view of the universe is that our universe started in 
in a singularity, which happened 30, 13.6 uh, billion years ago. Uh, some people call it Big Bang, but it's not a bang, it's not an explosion, it's a singularity. Space and time started at that point and at that time. Uh, and then the universe expanded and, uh, you know, you get uh, stars, galaxies, etc. And human beings. And what outside? There's nothing. I mean, the, if you if you think uh, the highest velocity is the speed of light. So if you take a sphere, which is 13.6 billion light years large as a radius, well, there the, the can be nothing outside that. Okay. Um, I think I'll end here uh, just by telling you that the astronomical arguments that I <laughs> have told you in Dante's Divine Comedy are only a few of them, uh, um, about one and a half years ago, I wrote a book with Massimo Capaccioli about trying to deal about all these arguments. It's in Italian. But uh, then we wrote an English version of, of the book, which, is, which you can see here, uh, edited by Word Scientific. And uh, so if you are interested in knowing about the other astronomical arguments in the Divine Comedy, you can read them here. And I want to end by the last verse of the Divine Comedy, L'amor che muove il sole e l'altre stelle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Spirello. Um, that uh, was, for someone who has not um, gone into uh, the uh, Divine Comedy as deeply, uh, quite enlightening for uh, the, um, I don't know, the, 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 the journey that uh, starts out as going, um, I don't know, kind of like Jules Verne, journey to the center of the earth, but then transforms into a journey across the uh, across the universe and such um that um you know cer certainly opened my eyes to to what um what we're seeing here mm -hmm. thank you uh, uh i don't know if if you foresee that there could be questions or uh, we expect there will be questions. I always ask the first question. Um, Please. And so my first question um, has to deal with, um, yeah, actually the variety of the um, things that that I, I sort of sparked on um, uh, in terms of things, because you talk about, uh, in this is a 12th century book, um, but he's talking about, uh, you're mentioning the earth as a sphere and sort of accepting the idea that the earth is a sphere when, you know, in, in history, we sort of think of that um, as being uh, something that uh, happened much later during the Renaissance. Um, so it sort of has allegories to, as I said, Jules Verne earlier, but also to uh, Galileo uh, and touch. And it, it, it when you think of it, when you mention him as a genius, it really, um, the, the parallels across history were, were, were extremely strong to me. Um, and I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Mm. Well, the, the, the fact that the, the earth is a sphere actually was known uh, by mm -hmm. the Greeks. Um, I think uh, I may be wrong, but it was maybe Parkos. Or, or a Greek guy who measured, actually measured the, the radius of the Earth by noticing that the that in, in the same day, like the um, summer equinox, the, the sun would get to the bottom of a, of a well in Aswan, in the southern Egypt, and uh, would actually uh, not be vertical in in uh, in the northern part of Egypt or in Greece, and by uh, by the difference in angle of the sun to to the surface of the Earth, 
and the distance of the two points, he could measure the, the radius of the Earth quite accurately, actually. So it was right. well known that the mm -hmm. Earth was round. What but was as you say, you know, a, lot of, a lot of that knowledge was lost um, in, well, into the uh, Middle Ages. So No, no. Well, well yeah. Some of that knowledge was lost. Definitely, uh, at the when when the library of Alexandria burned, and, and uh, after that, but he went back to Europe uh, through the Arabs. And but I'm, I'm sure that the actually the knowledge of the Earth being round was never really lost, even in the West. What what they didn't know, and what Galileo and others, Kepler. Um, dealt with uh, was was the fact that the earth is not at the center of the universe there was the mm. sun so that that's but that's another another argument and it, the 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 sphericity of the earth was known right well also the um the uh, variations on the moon is uh striking with uh, the galileo observations that uh, uh of the lunar mare and and the variations yeah. on the moon that was another uh, one of the parallels that i i, I had seen on this um let's see uh grant has been monitoring the chat more closely than i have um can we uh, grant do you want to turn on your video and uh, see if we have any questions from our youtube chat yeah absolutely um i've got one to start us off which i like which is uh especially in the time of dante there are a lot of things that he was thinking about frank kind of mentioned that we kind of take for granted <laughs> what kind of technology would he have had to have these sort of observations or these like grand ideas well um, very little technology would be none in the sense that uh in terms of aids to the eye there was none so they they would look at, at the stars at the planets uh, at the sky uh, by the naked eye there, there was no way out of that it would take only uh, quite a i mean a few centuries three four centuries before galileo in 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 1609 first pointed uh, uh, um, a telescope to the sky uh so 1609 was much later and and as you know as soon as galileo did look at the sky not by the naked eye but with some instrument he he made uh, incredible discoveries like the mountains of the moon like the satellites of jupiter the faces of venus uh, uh and and so on and they were published in the in the Siderius Nuncius in uh, just a year later in 1610. Uh, but that was long after Dante. Uh, Spirilla, would you mind stopping your screen share real quick so that the audience can uh, see all of us? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> <coughs> So did you have uh, another question there, there, Grant? Or I can try and mine through my things that I've got. I've got so many notes. Um, in particular, the, um, the relevance of the Aristotelian uh, view of the, um, of the universe as uh, perfect spheres and such, and the sort of parallels to the, um, the nine spheres and then the nine other spheres that um, uh you mentioned for for dante's universe um how much i mean what sort of correlation is there between the aristotelian view um and and dante's view, dante's presentation well uh dante definitely had a very uh big admiration for aristotle uh but mostly as a, as a philosopher um also, in a sense, the view of the universe, but the, the Aristotle did not have his own view of the universe. He was uh, helped by astronomers, I mean, by Hipparchus, uh, Ptolemeo. So these were the astronomers who actually had built the view of the universe at the Dante's time. Aristotle 
uh, did not do that. But still, uh, Dante was a great admirer because of uh, his philosophy and uh, his logic and yeah. Yeah, and you uh, were spot on when you mentioned how um, back in those days, being a philosopher meant you could study all different of what all different types of sciences that we consider totally disparate today. And I absolutely agree with you. I'm totally jealous of uh, folks who lived in that time for at least that aspect, you know, mm. being able to uh, be an expert in many different sciences, which is totally impossible today. <laughs> it is. It is. In fact. Uh, uh, let me tell you a, a little story about about this. You know, in in uh, in, in 2021 was the 700th anniversary of Dante's death, so there were big celebrations in Italy and also elsewhere in the world. And, and because of that, I gave several conferences about Dante's uh, cosmography. Um, and in, in one of them, uh, after I'd finished my talk. Uh, somebody came to me and he said, well, I am a teacher in high school and, and I teach Dante. You know, in Italy, uh, Dante is taught in high school in the last three years. And in each one of the, of the last three years, one reads at high school, Inferno, Purgatory and, and Paradise. And so I, I read this all to my students. But when I get to the second canto of Paradise, I skip it because I don't know how to explain it. You know, the second canto of Paradise, the one I thought uh, talked about, uh, it's about the, the moon spots. And of course, somebody who does not know about uh, the, um, um, the fact that the surface brightness does not depend on distance, how can he explain the canto? So he told me, I can, and as you see, this is this is reinforces my idea that you 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 cannot just listen to one person if you want to understand Dante. You have to listen to several ones. Uh, yes, it's a, it sounds like a many faceted uh, presentation. Um, I think I saw another question in the chat there, Grant. Did you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Uh, does Dante try to tell us how the earth shifted? Uh, this person makes reference to the circles and stones for calculating positions after the 13,000 year disaster. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I do not understand this question. Yeah, I wasn't sure what this question was, was referring to either with the 13,000 year disaster, what that meant. Okay. 13,000 years is just half of the period of the procession of the equinoxes, but this is the only thing I can say. <laughs> it's okay. Um, <laughs> did Dante use Virgil and Homer to help him write his poem like Milton? Ah, ah that's an interesting question. Well, definitely yes, but there are interesting things to say about this. Uh, of course, Virgil was very much loved by Dante and admired by Dante, and and this is demonstrated definitely by the fact that Virgil is Dante's leader throughout hell and paradise. You know, this is very it means that he was very important for Dante. But about Homer, it's it's different. Well, first of all. Dante could not read Greeks, Greek, ancient Greek. He could not read it. So he had uh, heard about Homer, definitely, but probably only through translations in, 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 in Latin. Um, and in fact, it's, it's very interesting that when he talks about Ulysses, who's of course the... the the main person in 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 in, in Homer's uh, Odyssea, um, well, he does not refer to what Homer wrote, but he he he, he tells a new story, a completely new story, uh, which is the story of the last journey of Ulysses. Uh, uh, trying to discover the, the 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 earth outside the Gibraltar, outside the limits made by Hercules. So, 
yeah I, it, it, it's hard to uh, actually i've read something about this people do not really know how much dante knew about homer's works he probably had heard about it but maybe he did not know a lot got gotcha. mm -hmm. all right okay. so we have another good one um okay. this will be the last one because we're getting to time sure okay um did dante travel to other regions or did he spend most of his time in florence no 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 dante um was exiled uh from florence by on in 1301 <laughs> and when he was uh 35 years old uh and it's not by chance that actually the, the the divine's comedy trip is is imagined to be right on that year 13 or one uh but then since he was exiled he could not go back to florence although he wanted to he, so he traveled around italy in in many different places um he spent he spent a lot of time uh in Verona, uh, Verona is is a town in in the northeast of Italy, and and uh, that town was ruled by a family called uh, Della Scala, and he spent quite a lot of time there. Uh, actually, um, his son Pietro uh, also lived there, and his son in in thirteen fifty three, actually the twenty eighth of April of thirteen fifty three bought a land near Verona in 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 a, in a region where they make good wine Valpolicella near Verona and that piece of land is still owned by my family uh, then Dante lived also quite a few years in Ravenna you know in the on near near the Adriatic coast where he actually died and he is buried there so he traveled, he traveled around Italy quite a lot. But although if you go around Italy, in, in, in many towns, you see stones which are, yeah, Dante has been here. Yeah. Well, uh, be careful, because actually the, the presence of Dante is documented by documents of the time only in Florence, Verona, Ravenna, and there is another town which is called Sarzana. Sarzana is a town uh, in, in, in the north of Tuscany, um, near Liguria, near, near La Spezia. So, uh, Dante has been there because there is a document made by a lawyer, uh, a document of the time, which says uh, that Dante was there and he actually had testified for some uh, reasons there. So be careful. People <laughs> tell, ah, Dante's been here, Dante's been here. Yeah. <laughs> but this is not documented anyway got yeah I got, oh, I, yeah sort of in the u.s we have the uh, george washington slept here type thing uh, yeah. where people always claiming that you know famous people ha had come through there all right well thank you so much um this really uh transforms the story uh, or gives a totally new aspect to the story uh for this um i will say that next month is november 1st uh, black holes, how do we see that which gives off no light? We hope to see all of you there. Uh, thank you very much again, Sparello, and we thank will you. see you, everybody, next month. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>